Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. I'm your host, Roger Connect, and I'm honored to actually have each and every week new guests to help you actually implement in your business things that you can do to ensure that you're getting paid what you're worth. This is a podcast committed to helping you have a successful accounting, bookkeeping, or tax business. Now, as a podcast, we're actually addressing various topics that may range from things related to marketing and sales, pricing, onboarding clients, perhaps it's client relationships, retaining the clients, offering quality services, and so much more. Each week, I invite you to listen and hear what it is that we're learning from the experts that you can do in your business to ensure that you have the premier accounting firm in your area and, in fact, are getting paid what you are worth. As your host, I've been doing this for more than 20 years, helping individuals both start and build successful accounting, bookkeeping, and tax businesses literally around the world, and in doing so, making some great friends and building wonderful relationships. Each week I have on the podcast various experts, people that are doing exactly like yourself, as well as individuals that are experts in their own right as to what it is that we can be doing as accounting professionals to ensure that we're in fact offering quality services and helping our clients build their businesses. Now, for today, I have an excellent guest, someone that I'm excited to have on the show. It is Melissa Houston. She is the founder of Fractional CFO Agency. She is a columnist at Forbes.com and the host of the Business Society podcast. She's a licensed chartered professional accountant. And as uh, such, she's also a financial strategist for CEOs and helps successful business owners increase their profit margins without having to increase revenue. Now, she does this so that she can help them keep more money in their pockets while increasing their personal wealth. Melissa's seen herself climb from the bottom and all the way back up to the top after she personally and financially bounced back from concealing over $100,000 in personal debt from her husband. She shares her story to remind people that your mistakes don't define you. And as humans, we all make mistakes and can recover from them. She uses that to teach entrepreneurs to become financially literate in order to create profit in their businesses. Now, she's had over 20 years of business experience with large and small corporations and government businesses. She's also worked with nonprofit industries while specializing in internal controls, corporate accounting, budgets, financial reporting, corporate and personal tax, audit, and SRED and ED. Now, Melissa enjoys helping business owners build their businesses by increasing their financial management skills. She basically believes that your numbers are telling you a story, so make sure you're listening to it. Now, Melissa is also very passionate about helping business owners go from six-figure to seven-figure businesses and achieve their personal financial dreams. When Melissa isn't working with entrepreneurs to become better CEOs of their businesses, she can be found at her cottage with her husband, Jamie, two children, and their three dogs. So there's a lot there, Melissa, that we're going to be discussing. So (laughs) thank you. Welcome to the show. It was a mouthful. (laughs) Now, with that being said, I've got so much I want to start with, but I'm going to start just with the basics of what led you to become an accounting professional. Tell us about how that all started. Was this something that you were expecting to do early on in your, your studies when you're in high school, college? How did that all start? Yeah, it's funny that you asked me that because I certainly didn't dream of being an accountant when I was a little girl. You know, (laughs) I always wanted to be a teacher and I ended up, um, my, my first career was in social work. So I worked in social work for about six years before I went back to school and I realized social work was a very high burnout, um, field to be in. Mm -hmm. So I went back and I started business and I had to pick a major So I was trying to figure out what I really wanted to do. And I was talking to my dad and my dad, you know, being the reasonable, pragmatic man that he is, said, you know, I think you can do a lot with accounting. You know, you can go get your CPA. And I was like, okay, sounds good. And that's what I did. (laughs) You know, it's funny. I've never thought of it this way until you just mentioned that you'd gone the social worker route and then accounting. Mm -hmm. Having worked with so many business owners, I've found myself being a marriage counselor, a child therapist. I've been just with them dealing with depression, anxiety. I mean, there are a variety of social type things that may be carried over to working with accounting professionals or CEOs, just natural skill sets or uh, maybe best practices, if you will. Have you found Mm -hmm. that to be true? Absolutely. I love the fact that I married my social work skills with my accounting and money expert skills. And Uh that's exactly what I do with my clients now, you know, and, you know, especially around the fear about money. There's so much fear and emotion tied to money. 
and walking through clients with money mindset issues or any Mm -hmm. mindset issues, um, especially as business owners, we have to be really on top of our game. Um, I love doing it. You know, I, this whole mindset thing regarding money and when working with owners, CEOs, it's right. Um, some people are raised with this idea of money doesn't grow on trees. They don't mm-hmm. think of money as being abundant or prevalent. Uh, mm-hmm. There's that old analogy of uh, you have to work hard to to be successful. There's a lot of stigmas that a lot of people in business put upon themselves that are barriers to success simply because they think it has to be hard, difficult, and money doesn't go on trees. So why am I yeah. expecting there to be a lot of wealth? How do you address a lot of that? Yeah. So, you know, we start talking about their feelings towards money, um, you know, just by going through questions and conversations and building that rapport and relationship with clients, I can start asking them deeper, more personal questions. And it really doesn't take me long to see where the mindset issues usually lie. And for so many business owners, I find that there's a level of feeling worthy when it's tied to money and wealth. And, you know, these are things that we talk about and we talk through. And I also am a firm believer, like I'm, you know, there, I know there's a lot of money mindset coaches out there that only yeah. coach on money, uh-huh. but I'm not a woo type of person. And <laughs> I believe a lot of um, the way you can overcome mindset issues is through action. So when we take action and we, and we teach the entrepreneur how to understand their their business finances and how that helps crush their CEO imposter syndrome that they may be Uh feeling or, um, you know, just basically any negativity that's in their relationship with money and how they can overcome it. A lot of it is done through action. And when they get to the other side, they have so much more confidence. So I've also experienced this. I'm curious, have you found a common thread something that's familiar as you've worked with these people that are obviously running businesses and in many Mm -hmm. rights, they're already successful, but Mm -hmm. you mentioned like imposter syndrome, there tends to sometimes be something holding them back. Have you, have you a thought or a theory as to what that might be and what might be a good uh, breakthrough to address that? Yeah. I mean, I work primarily with women entrepreneurs and what I have seen are these old um, stories and, and old messages that they've been getting since childhood. And I mean, I'm not immune to it as well, where we hear messages like, you know, you're a girl, you're not supposed to be good at business. You have no right in the boardroom. Um, you know, you're not supposed to be successful. You shouldn't be making more money than your husband or your spouse. Um, you know, you shouldn't be making more money than your parents. There's a lot of guilt tied to it, you know, being wealthy is a bad thing. I'm not going to be a good person if I have a lot of money. There's so many messages out there that we hear. And it's not just for women, it's for men too, right? And Mm -hmm. we hear these messages or, you know, our money story was established in our childhood. You know, maybe you've grown up in a situation where there wasn't a lot of money in your home when you were growing up and, and, you know, money was always tight and money was stressful and there may have been a lot of fighting around money. So mm-hmm. everybody carries a unique money story. Yes. But essentially, it all I find it all comes around to people feeling if they're worthy of wealth or not. You know, as you were sharing that, I one, first of all, I, I appreciate the perspective. I, I think what you fair, shared is right on. As I heard it, though, I related to a client that, that I worked with for more than a year. Um, just to kind of share her story, she was in a situation where her biz- her husband purchased a business. Um, he was, uh, he, or he is an accounting person. He's a CPA. He works in, the, in another uh, company and uh, just thought it was a great purchase, a great investment. So he buys this, this printing business. And the wife just was content working at the local school where her children attended as a teacher's assistant, was doing great. Well, it turned out that in purchasing the business, he couldn't leave his company because it was their primary income to go run the business. And the business started to flounder a little bit and needed their attention as owners. And lo and behold, she gets thrust into running a printing company. And she's like, what in the world am I doing here? Her confidence was such that she ended up hiring me as her business coach. And as we went through that entire experience, everything you were sharing, she I, she could have identified when we started working together. Yeah. But after more than a year working with her, she was able to really boister up her confidence to realize she was in the right role. She could do what was expected of her and she could actually be the business owner that she 
was portrayed or thought of by her employees, but she never saw herself as. The imposter syndrome was definitely a, a part of it. Yeah. And as we went through that whole coaching, by the more than a year working with her, when we were finished, she was spot on her game. She had all the confidence she needed. She was able to address a lot of the challenges faced with employee issues, with marketing issues. She became very confident and it was really just opening up and giving her permission to excel where she didn't really think she had permission. She didn't see herself as that business owner and lo and behold, lo and behold it was within her the whole time. So yeah, I love what you were just sharing because that brought that story to the to my memory and I really enjoyed that relationship with her as I worked as her, as her business coach. It's such a great um, you know, to be able to see from the beginning to the end and see that transformation, you must feel so happy for her. I do, because I know when I first started to work with her, she was embarrassed. I mean, when you meet a business owner initially, there's too often this this first impression. They've got to hold their head high, be mm -hmm. you know strong with their shoulders, say, I run a business. Yes, I'm the president. And, and so they're going to present themselves well. But when you then get into a closed room and you start asking how the company is going and what are some of the challenges they're facing... And with that rapport, I mean, obviously it took a little bit of, of, of communication to help her feel relaxed enough to open up. But once she started to then reveal, here are some of the things I'm facing, here are the challenges I'm dealing with, here are some of the decisions I'm struggling to make, all of a sudden she became vulnerable. And as she revealed herself to me, we were starting to then address self-confidence issues. We were addressing imposter syndrome, as you mentioned. Uh, there were a lot of things that she was not giving her permission to be. And honestly, she was going back to her husband who had initially purchased the company, trying to justify decisions she was making in the organization. And I had to say, look, you're the president. You don't need to excuse yourself, make decisions, stick to your guns and understand that you'll let the consequences fall where they may, but they are your decisions, own them. Don't feel as if you need to excuse or justify anything to your husband, even though you know, obviously he was the, the investor as much as she was, she was running the company. And when she started to understand that she was the president, she started to act accordingly. And it took a, a number of months to get there, but to talk to her today, totally different woman. She's, she's very, very comfortable with her, her position and role and running a very successful business. So I love that. And I love stories like that. They just make me so happy. Well, I think that's why both of us do what we do. It's one yeah. of those things to work <laughs> with a business owner and you see that evolution. I, I mean, COVID a few years ago was definitely a challenge. And I was pleased that initially, I, I, I go back to March of 2020, everybody just as the whole economy started to unravel, all my clients started calling me and others that weren't clients, just really in a panic of their business model collapsing around them, losing yeah. clients, lo losing uh, uh, contracts, and really working with them through the coming months such that by about June, July, all the things started to really settle. The PPP loan came out. They, they had the financial capital to maybe work through the storm. Well, you go back now, 2020, as difficult as it was, every one of my clients and more did phenomenally well. They either did as good as they hoped, if not better. And in 2021, they did better than they had done in 2019. So all the companies stayed in business, did well, did better than they had done in the past. And Fantastic. all of it was because of them stepping to the plate, making the hard decisions and doing what yeah. needed to be done. And it was great to be a part of that as their coach to see all these clients really be successful in the process. So yeah, I've got, you know, a lot of stories that I'm very proud of with that. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I always say being an entrepreneur is definitely not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it's not, it's not. So let's get back to you because this is your story and I would love everyone to hear it. So I, I want to go back to accounting. You graduate now, having chosen to do, to do, to do this as a career outside of social work. Mm -hmm. You leave the, the school, you've got your degree. Where did the career take you to the point of wanting to start your own business? Tell us about that process. Yeah, I definitely had a journey. You know, I, I knew that I wasn't quite the best fit for accounting. You know, intellectually, for sure, I was there. You know, I could I could do the job. But my personality, I'm very much, you know, I love to work with people. And, you know, our field is known for being an introverted type of personality, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And, you know, so I kept searching. I was always curious and I would search for things that, you know, I could learn and learn really well, but then I'd get bored and I'd want to move on, right? So I started in corporate accounting in the high tech industry. Okay. And then after a couple of years, I moved into public accounting 
And then I moved into corporate tax, personal tax, um, SR and ED taxes, which mm-hmm. was really, really interesting. And then after having two children, um, I was feeling a lot of the burnout from the corporate world. So when my kids were, you know, probably around four and five, I moved to government work and okay. I stayed there and I worked in a lot of different um, accounting ways in the government. But what I really ended up specializing in was internal controls in the government. And then, you know, so I, I've i had a very, very interesting career and it's given me such a wide um, experience. You know, like I, I, I have experience in doing so many things, you know, audit, public accounting, working with small businesses, working with large businesses. I worked as a controller. I worked as a a CFO. Like I've done so many different things, but I also felt like um, I just was missing something. Right. And I knew, you know, probably back to, you know, 18 years ago, um, I always knew that I wanted to be in business for myself, but it always felt like the wrong time. You know, me being a woman, being a mom, you know, having responsibilities. um, I always felt like, Oh, the kids aren't old enough. I don't have the the time to commit to this. I don't have the money, the funds. Uh, we're we're saving for different things. Um, it's just not the right time, right? And that ended up being a huge injustice to myself because, ironically, by denying the feelings that I had of wanting to become an entrepreneur myself, I ended up, you know, trying to stuff those feelings down. And through my avoidance behavior, that kind of led to my story of debt. So I ended up spending a whole bunch of money to make myself feel better. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Yeah. (laughs) So then after all that, I went through a huge learning um, experience, went on a journey to figure out, you know, what what was going on with me. And I was like, you know what? I want to start my own business. I want to do this and I need to be true to myself. And so lo and behold, two years ago, I decided to branch out and start my own business. So... (laughs) <laughs> that, that kind of answers the question that I'm looking for. I lo- <laughs> the, the transition to go into starting a business and become an entrepreneur, I think is a very big thing. I mean, it's there's an entrepreneurial spirit that yeah. very few people have, and it can be uh, fostered, it can be developed. But to have that, that drive to say, I'm going to start my business, was it something that maybe happened in your career that caused you to say, this is what I need to do next? Was it something where you walked away from a job saying, this is my next story? I mean, what caused you to say, now's the moment and this is when I'm going to do it? You know, I love the way you phrase that question because I feel like you just brought me back into the room, uh, you know, 15 years ago when I was like in that moment where I'm like, when I go out on my own, this is what I'm going to do. And that moment was when I was working in public accounting and what happened was, you know, so business owners bring us our tax or their, their books to get their tax returns done. The typical relationship would be like, they'd see us on an annual basis, bring in the books, say, how are we doing? We would give them feedback, you know, here's some pointers. This is what you can do to improve your, your efficiencies. Um, You know, here's your tax return. Here's your tax saving tips. And Um, That would be it. But I would sit there with the partner in the room and I could see on the business owners faces that they had absolutely no idea what we were telling them. Right. And I'm like, this is such a waste. It's so unfortunate that the business owners um, aren't being educated in, you know, this is why we're telling you this so that you can do this, this and this instead of walking away being completely confused and end up doing nothing, right? So I had mentioned it to this partner who was not interested in hearing my ideas. So that okay. was kibosh. But I'm at that moment, I knew when I was going to go out into business, I was going to teach entrepreneurs, business owners, CEOs, because I've seen it all over the map, project managers, CEOs, all types of people who really don't understand their business numbers and don't understand how valuable that knowledge is to help create more profit in their business. So as you're sharing that, I've got a a little story to mention. Just this week, I'm working with a client. Um, It's a client I've worked with with for some time. And in my services, I don't uh, actually do the accounting work. And there's a long story behind it. But the short answer is, is as an accounting school, 
we have all of our graduates, alumni that have started and built their own accounting business. And so I don't want to be in competition with my, my own uh, alumni. But the point is, is I oftentimes work with business owners and they have someone else that performs uh, their accounting needs, whether it's internal or external. And I'm dealing right now with someone who, uh, with their financials, as we get into discussing what they are, once again, just like you're describing, the business owner is paying for an accounting service wherein they're receiving financial reports, and yet they have no clue what the reports are that they're receiving, what the information means. And so I'm now asking the questions and trying to find out what these things mean, and I'm giving direction as to what needs to take place in the financial reports, all because the accounting professional isn't doing, in my opinion, what their job is. And I think it's just a disservice as an accounting profession that we have clients where accounting professionals provide all this financial report, yet the business owner, when asked what this information is about their own company, they can't even use it, um, understand it, and yet they're the ones living it on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it's a sad narrative, once again, of the accounting professional dropping the ball and not helping the, the business owner have useful information to run their companies. And so what you're describing, there's a need for it. I deal with it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You're experiencing it as well. So you get to this point now where you feel that there's a need. Again, why start your business? Why, even after 15 years of interests and itchings to do so, why start the business two years ago? Was there a particular thing that said, this is the day? Yeah. So when I went into debt and the crap hit the fan and I, you know, was completely busted and exposed and had to pick up the pieces and, you know, um, repair my marriage and, and the whole bit, um, I knew that I would never want to do this again. Because, you know, as, as a finance prof professional, I knew what I was doing, but I still allowed myself to do it, right? So uh -huh. that always left you know, an imprint in my mind, like, why am I allowing myself to do this? Like, I know better, but I'm, I'm deliberately ignoring my own advice, right? And I was just like, it was like, um, I was a train wreck, right? Just, just the train was going out of control, and then eventually yeah. it crashed. Yeah. And um, so what I swore to myself at that moment was that I was going to figure out how I got to the point where I allowed it. So I did it definitely a journey of introspection. And this journey went on for about two years. And I ended up meeting up with a coach and I had never done coaching myself. And I had no idea what I was getting into, but we started a coaching program. And, you know, as anybody who's been through coaching realized that, you know, they peel back the layers and try to get into the to the real meat of the position or, or the, the reason. And I, I'm somebody who had done therapy my whole life. So like I, I felt like I, you know, was on par and everything, you know, was fine. And, you know, like there were really no issues. So therapy and coaching was very different to me. And so through coaching, I realized, holy, that's exactly the reason I am denying myself this part of me that really needs attention, right? Mm -hmm. I really felt that urge to get out, do it myself, stop working for other people, do it myself, see what I can do for myself, prove it to myself that I could do it. Love it. And do it, right? So that's kind of when the the switch flipped. And the minute that switch flipped, I was 150% in. I was about to say the same thing. That's when you go all in. Yeah. It's, there's no turning back. You burn the the uh, boats, and all of a sudden you're in a situation where it's I have to make this work. This yeah. is going to work. All right, so that was helpful. I appreciate that. Now we've been alluding to this whole financial thing. You had me shared in the intro. You've brought it up a few times. What the heck happened? What were you doing? <laughs> Frick. I, you sound like my hey, husband. Hold on, a, hold on, <laughs> hold on a second. Just to be clear, you brought this up, not me. So, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Me, <laughs> so you wanted to own it. Tell me about it. Yeah, I'm gonna own it. Yeah. So I was just like so bored in my job, right? I, I okay. had been there for a few years, and um, you know, like I'm, I'm pretty restricted living as a mother. You know, coming home, taking care of the kids, making supper, very routine, right? Yeah. And um, then, you know, the kids were getting a little older and my friends were like, hey, we should go away for weekends and leave our husbands with the kids. So we would do shopping trips. And oh, okay. so, you know, I would throw a couple of thousand dollars on shopping. And I was like, I'd get this little buzz from it, right? 
I'd feel good. I'd have new stuff and I'd feel like I kind of broke out of my routine. And then at work, I would get really bored and I'd start surfing the internet. Okay. And then, you know, the online shopping started. And then I would just buy, buy, buy. Things would come to the door. My husband would question everything. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. We've got money. Don't worry. Because, you know, being the accountant, he left me in charge of the personal finances and he would just trust me with everything. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And then I'm like, you know what? I think we need to like, you know, renovate the house. So we would start like these things that we wanted to do. We we had done some kitchen upgrades, some living room upgrades, floor upgrades, laundry room, you know, stuff like that. And then my husband's like, you know, we're spending a lot of money. Like what's going on here? Oh yeah, we may have borrowed a bit of money, but don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Like I got under control. Because you have to remember that him and I were always very tight with our finances. Uh-huh. And we had a plan from the time we got married to get to where we were. And we were always on track. So for him to think that I would derail it, it was likely a very um, unlikely scenario for him, right? He had full confidence in me. And then I I, I, I had at this point probably about $50,000 of, of debt that I didn't come clean about. I may have told him there was, you know, maybe $10,000 of debt. Okay. You know, nothing we couldn't manage, right? I was very manipulative. And then um, I thought, we need a swimming pool in our backyard. And he's like, we don't need a swimming pool. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we do. We've got such a nice yard. Wouldn't it look great with a swimming pool? And anyways, I ended up conning him into it. And then through the installation of the swimming pool, and anybody who's put a swimming pool in knows that it's not just the pool. It's the landscaping. It's Uh the shed, the equipment, Uh all sorts, the deck, the this, the that. There's so much that goes into your backyard, right? Yeah, there's there's a difference between there's that snowball analogy and an avalanche. The yeah, swimming I kind pool of is an the avalanche. avalanche route, eh? Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so that's when the avalanche just kind of buried me. And it was time to to face the facts and say, okay, I I am doing something that I shouldn't be doing. All right. So there's a few things that I want to go into. And yes, starting as as I did with the what were you thinking question does definitely Mm -hmm. apply. But I I want to just tap onto a few things here. One, what was that guilty pleasure that that was it the shoes, the dresses, the the remodeling of the home? What was the thing that that you were comfortable maybe uh, justifying that allowed you to get further in debt than you intended to be? Because I can imagine that the shopping sprees, you could say, ah, you know, we'll pay for that in a month or two. That was yeah. a little excessive, but it was much. But what was the thing that really broke your character and said, and and really caused you maybe some sleepless nights going, what am I thinking? This is getting out of control. What were some of those things? Was it the remodeling of the house? Did it Did it not hit until the swimming pool? It was the remodeling of the house. And definitely the swimming pool. And I remember okay. when the swimming pool was going in and they were filling it with water. I remember standing there thinking, I still don't feel satisfied. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Now, this question I'm going to ask, I don't know if it's the first time you've been asked it, but I am going out on a limb here. As an accounting professional, I think a lot of people look at us as professionals presuming we are financially sound and savvy mm-hmm. uh, that that outside looking in we've got our crap together yeah when did you feel as if maybe you were the imposter now because you obviously had lost control i definitely felt the imposter and that's a really good question the minute i took on any credit card debt okay because i was definitely the only debt i owed was um car payments maybe uh-huh. And they were totally reasonable. And my mortgage. Yeah. You know, my husband and I had set ourselves up for that to be to be like that. So I felt like the imposter the minute I was being untrue to myself, right? By putting yeah. myself into debt. And believe me, I toyed with the emotions of sharing my story because the one of the first things I thought was, what are my coworkers and colleagues going to think of me when they find out that I've done this? But, you know, the irony of it all is I've had so many people come out, finance professionals that have come to me and said, I am so grateful that you shared your story because I do not feel alone. Well, and that's where I was going to go with this. Mm -hmm. The the first thing I was going to mention is I do feel there's a lot of people that can identify 
with this sense of I'm not being true to myself. Um, I'm, I know better. It's that moment where all of a sudden in your mind, you actually say to yourself, you know what? I know better than this. I shouldn't be doing this. But the point is, is just like you say, said, I, I am a great, I am grateful for you being vulnerable to share this because I do believe a lot of people can actually relate to it. Mm -hmm. There's the ideal of what we're aspiring to be both as individuals or in this case, maybe accounting professionals. And then there's the reality. We're all imperfect. We all have things that we're, we're trying to do better. It doesn't mean that the journey isn't um, kind of full of these challenges. That's what it is. It's a journey of, of uh, unexpected consequences. Life gets thrown at us. Health issues come in. And then all of a sudden, you've got these debts and unexpected things. And uh, I, I really do appreciate you sharing your story. And I think it's a good part of who you are because as we also work with CEOs, I see the same thing happening all the time. Um, and, and tell me if this is something that you can relate to. I'll have business owners who are reluctant to share either the successes they're having in business with their spouses because they think the spouse will believe that to be permission to go spend money that they uh, have because they're doing well as a company, or it's the opposite. They won't share with their spouses that they're struggling and the spouse unknowingly goes and spends money presume, presuming that things are okay and the business owner is going like, but crap, everything's falling apart at the office. The company is unraveling. What what we've had as a norm for the last few years, the company is is just floundering and yet the spouse continues to live a lifestyle that no longer is prudent. And that business owner, whether it's success or failure, isn't just being true to the spouse because of the lack of communication. And it's no different than just what you've experienced or expressed. Would you agree? I would completely agree. Absolutely. And this is, you know, where I talk about money being so emotionally charged because all our, like the, the scenarios that you just explained, these are scenarios that are driven from emotion. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's like either I'm successful and she'll deceive me or I'm a failure and she will leave me or, yes. you know, like whatever the story is. Yes. No, it's exactly right. Because sometimes the business is struggling and yet in order to impress potential clients, potential customers, the spouse, the children, they end up making these decisions that really are wrong. They just cannot do this. And they they somehow justify making these decisions. And it's it's not wise. It shouldn't be done. Yeah, it shouldn't be done. But I mean, it goes back to the other thing too, right? Where we're all human. Yes. And, you know, just because I'm an accountant doesn't mean I'm not imperfect. Right. That's um, right. You know, and we all have these desires of like, hey, if I drive this nice car, people will think I'm important. Or if I, you know, look like I'm making a million bucks, I'll feel good about myself or whatever the case may be. Right. And, you know, knowing what is that expression? When you know better, you do better. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And some people just don't know how to manage their money. And, you know, when they reach out for help, they learn. And then when they know better, they can do better. Yeah. All right. So this brings me to what in the world is a fractional CFO? <laughs> and and I ask that, I ask it that way because I do know some people don't understand what that is. I know. And I'm laughing because so many people ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> what is a fractional CFO? So tell tell our listeners, what is that? Yeah, so a fractional CFO, fractional is just a fancy way of saying part-time CFO. So a chief financial officer is the person who is the right-hand person to the CEO of the business. Mm -hmm. And we are there to support, help guide you as the CEO um, to your financial vision and dreams and goals. And so as the senior financial person, you know, we're in charge of the accounting department or the bookkeeper, whatever, whatever your setup is in your business. And we ensure that the financial reporting is being done on a monthly basis, compliance is done, um, tax remittances, the whole bit. And we are there to help you with your 12 month plus, you know, three year, five year, 10 year forecasting for where you want your business to go to. So especially if you're growing your business, you get to the point where you need a, a CFO, but not all businesses can bring on a CFO full time, right? So a fractional CFO is having that CFO in your business on a part-time basis. So you're paying, you know, maybe a 
quarter of the salary that you would for a full-time CFO. So it's very cost effective. You still get that CFO guidance and, you know, um, professional guidance and advice, but you're getting it at a cost effective price. Yeah, the, it's fractional is just a nice way of saying part time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, fractional is uh, is an accountant's way of saying you got me, but just not all the way. Um, exactly. You know, yeah. ironically, I'll give you a little bit of um, inf- like useless information. But yeah. if you if you Google part time CFO and you Google fractional CFO, fractional CFO has more hints. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So people are like, why don't you just say part time? Well, because I'm thinking ahead and I'm doing SEO searches. Yeah, there you go. Okay, good. Yeah. That's that's something <laughs> I, I didn't know that, but that's funny. All right, so yeah. here's something that's interesting that I'd add to your description. The fractional CFO is obviously someone that ex- that's external from the company. They're not a W-2 employee, so they're not always in the business, but the role of, the comp- of this fractional CFO is still the same. And mm-hmm. I would break it down into three distinct responsibilities. One, they're trying to help with the CEO tell the financial narrative of the company. They're trying to make sure that the financial reports, everything that's going on in the story that the financial reports are telling complements what the business is trying to do, especially to outside investors, the banks, the shareholders, or whomever it may be. So people that aren't involved in the day-to-day operations of the company, that may be the investors, shareholders, and so forth, the banks, they can look at that narrative that the financial reports are telling and it's communicating what the CEO wants it to say. And so that's one of the things that I think is very important. The second thing is cash flow. Um, We're looking not just at the current needs, but it's forecasting what are the future needs of the company with the growth expectations and is the cash going to be there to run the business? And so it's helping the CEO understand whether or not they're going to be needing either capital infusions, lines of credit, investors, because the fractional CFO is coming in to try and give the the CEO forewarning of cash flow needs. And then the third thing that I would say is just perspective. You've got a CEO that's running the business, perhaps caught up in the day-to-day operations of the business. The CEO may not be able to see some of the things that the CFO is going to be able to um, identify through the financial reports. And so what we're trying to do there is not just tell the narrative and not just address the cash flow needs of the company, but we're also trying to actually then point out trends, analysis, things that the CEO may not be able to notice that the financial reports are revealing. How, how am I doing there? Does that make sense? You know, I'm like, wow, I'm ready to give you a huge applause and get you to record my commercial. That was very well put. Well, thank you. Very nice. Yeah. There you go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that said, I'm going to now ask, you've got this narrative of you personally, and you know, you, you kind of make that part of your story. You've got what you're doing as a CFO. Um, you've got a point here where, where I, th- I think it's appropriate to ask, how do you deal with the CFO now, or excuse me, the CEO needing to understand that they need to have permission to forgive themselves for their mistakes and be willing and ready to build for a better tomorrow. Um, what what does that really mean? Yeah, that's a really good question. So when I work with my clients, I do a lot of coaching as well, right? So uh-huh. not only are you bringing me on as a fractional CFO and a partner in your business, you are bringing on somebody who's going to help you identify blind spots like you know, any, you know, mindset issues or what have you um, going on in in your head to help keep you or help you to be the best CEO that you can possibly be. So I'm very cognizant, like, you know, the social work side of me comes into play in my coaching. And I see, you know, a lot of ways I can help CEOs build and grow their business. And I am there to ensure that they get to their goals successfully. Perfect. You know, I'm glad you brought in that coaching element. You uh, mentioned earlier working with a coach. I'm going to bring that bring that up in a minute. But before we go there, I wanted to ask: You're talking about revenue goals and financial. What's is there a difference, and is one better profit or revenue? I mean, what? Yeah. Which which should I focus on? Yes, you should absolutely. Revenue is great, but you should absolutely be focusing on profit. You need that revenue coming into your business to keep your business going. But if you're not making a profit, like if you're making a million dollars of revenue a year and you have nothing to show for that, that's a big issue. So you really need to focus on creating a profitable business because that's the reason why businesses are in business 
is to create profit. And when you have that profit, you can reinvest into the business and grow it. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. Profit is king. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I know there's a phrase or a, a, a idiom out there that I think everyone can identify with, and it's revenue is vanity. I was just going to say that. Profit is sanity. <laughs> yes. It's, it's just like, I, I, I used to go to, well, not used to, I've been to many uh, galas where they're awarding businesses. So here where I'm at, my corporate headquarters are in the state of Utah and they'll have uh, Mountain Mountain West is a bank and they host for very specific business reasons, a gala where they recognize the top 100 uh, private businesses in the state. And having been to that numerous times, receiving awards for our growth as a company, it's fascinating to see who's in attendance because it's all based on revenue. And year after year, you look back to, you know, who won the the top 10 two years ago. And it's interesting. They had great revenue growth, no profit. So two years later, they're out of business. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's so common, right? Very, very common. So um, uh, there's also out there a book called Profit First. Are you familiar with that one? I am familiar with it. Good old Mike Michalowicz. Yeah. And you know what? I have to put a shameless plug in here because I do have a book coming out. I just got (gasps) signed with a publisher. Do we have a title? Cash Confident, An Entrepreneur's Guide to Creating a Profitable Business. Can you give us a little teaser as to what it's going to be addressing? Yeah, it's definitely going to be addressing, um, you know, a little bit of money mindset, um, creating a profitable business, how you create that profitable business and understanding how your business can work for you as being the biggest financial asset that you may own. Love it. Okay, good. And do we have a timeline? Unfortunately, at this point, we don't. Um, It's definitely going to be mid-2023, but we don't have an exact date yet. No, you're fine. I'll just tell you right now, it'll take you longer than you expect, so don't worry about it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Don't promise anything to anyone yet. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, don't do that. Okay, Uh, next question. Why do business owners have such a unique ability to create wealth? Because their business can be their their financial asset. You know, when you are creating your business, and this is another thing I work with my clients too, because, you know, I encourage them to dream big, right? Have big financial goals because you can attain this so much easier through a business than you can through traditional employment, right? Uh So as you grow your business and you create that profitability in your business, that is what's increasing the value. So... When I'm hearing you say that, one of the things I realize is there's a good deal of risk being an entrepreneur and running a Mm -hmm. business. And so one of the things I always stress is this philosophy that I've taught for years of your business needs to become a self-sustaining, living, breathing entity that is autonomous from the business owner. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it becomes basically like the golden goose. It can become this wealth machine. Um, so how can somebody leverage that to better themselves or their families? Well, okay, here, I'm going to quote you a statistic, and this is what I often talk about with, um, with clients, 82% of businesses fail due to financial mismanagement, right? Yeah. So, Yeah. yeah. So if you invest the time it takes to learn the financial business skills that you need to keep your business growing and being profitable, like that profitable growth then you've killed a lot of mm-hmm. risk right right away because you know what it yes. takes to create that profitable business, right? And ensuring that you understand, because, you know, quite often business owners don't understand their numbers. So when they're making f- decisions for their business, they have no idea if they're making profitable decisions or not, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. So my attitude is get to know your business numbers. I'm going to teach you and show you how they work so that when you are making your day-to-day business decisions, you understand which ones are profitable and which ones are not. You know, the way I would describe it, and I'm I'm agreeing with you, by mm-hmm. the way, the way I would describe it is cash flow. It's so often I work with businesses where I find out that they have revenue, they're actually selling, uh, they're they're uh, effective in the in the product. Um, that they have in the market. So people want what they're doing, the service they're offering. But the problem is, is oftentimes the revenue exists as as accounts receivable. They haven't been paid. Yes. And so it becomes a cash flow problem. And so the business owner is feeling quite good about themselves because they're selling. They're, They're actually seeing that people want what they have. 
but they don't have the cash flow mm-hmm. to meet the the payroll needs or other vendor needs. And so there becomes this cash flow crunch. And I distinctly remember I was attending an Inc. Um, Inc. 500 conference years ago, and they had a panel discussion where they were communicating that there was a meeting with a congressional committee and the Congress people were not understanding that businesses could be uh, financially positive with a net positive on the balance sheet and P&L from a, an accrual point of view, but negative on a cash yeah. point of view. And even though the company was profitable, go out of business, be bankrupt. And they couldn't understand that. And I think so many business owners experiencing it don't understand it as well. They're living it and they don't understand it. How am I busy selling? I'm I'm doing what I thought was going on, but yeah, I can't pay my bills. Yeah. And so to understand that is huge. huge. So I, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah, I love that you brought this up too, because it's funny because not too long ago, a lawyer had told me that she's had so many, and this is specifically women, who have emailed her to ask to send, um, you know, some sort of legal warning from the lawyer. If you don't pay your bill, you know, such and such is going to happen. Uh-huh. And the lawyer's first reaction is, well, you know, how many times have you emailed them and tried to collect it yourself? And they say, none. Yes. They're yes. so scared to go and try to get that money. And it could have just been an honest mistake, honest oversight. The person would have been like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea. Let me send that over right away. Yep. You just need to have a way of managing your receivables. When you're yeah. working with a business owner, and this is something that I've, I've actually experienced. The business owner is um, providing a service. They're so busy day after day providing the service. They are not processing the bills, the invoices, and sending them out for the services rendered. Mm-hmm. So now – a week or two or three goes by, they sit down on a weekend and they're realizing I need money, but I haven't invoiced for two or three weeks. They send out all these invoices and then they don't do it again for another two or three or four weeks. And then they send out another batch of invoices. Well, the problem is, is the customer is either realizing, well, maybe the money is not that important because they're slow getting around to invoicing me, or I forgot I owed this and I've spent the money. I've got to save the money to pay the invoice. Or it's basically, um, if this is what they want money-wise, and they're going to wait three weeks to get all, wait three weeks to pay them. There's so many things going on there if you don't have a process to manage your receivables to ensure you're getting paid in a timely manner. So, yes, I I really do identify with what you're trying to say there. Yeah, I love the points that you brought up, too, because it's so important. Yeah. All right. So here's what I want to do. We've been talking here now for some time. Great information, but I'm going to just kind of move through a few more things here quickly, because there are a few more things that I wanted to ask. One, as professionals, accounting professionals, we spend a lot of our time crafting, obviously, our own expertise. What do we need to be doing to equally give time and attention to our own businesses? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, you know, (laughs) I'm probably just as guilty as a lot of other um, accountants where, you know, the books are usually the last ones I do for my own business. Um, but, you know, and, and it's not just about focusing on, you know, the accounting side of the business, right? Um, you know, giving yourself visibility in your business, letting people know that you are an expert in your field, positioning yourself as an authority figure. Those are really good things that you can do for your business because getting that know, like, and trust from your clients before they actually meet you is mm-hmm. so important. That is very good advice. So I'm going to now make this personal for us. Are you ready? Yep. You you obviously started your business. It started also with this, this um, financial situation that we've already discussed. Uh, Jamie, he's obviously been there through this process of starting your business. What's it been like for you to have his support as you've run it started and run your company? Unbelievable support I have received from him. He is my biggest cheerleader, friend, and, you know, um, I, I don't have words that can describe that. I'm just so grateful for him. What do you think he's seen in you as he's watched you go through this process, starting and running your business? He's seen me transform from somebody who is a little unsure of themselves into somebody who's really, really owning it and being confident and confidently stepping into that role. 
of business owner and positioning mm-hmm. myself as a money expert and um, owning it. I love it. Your two children, they're teenagers. What do you think they're seeing in their mother? You know, they're teenagers and they don't say it much, but I know they are damn proud of me. And they're seeing their mother fight for what they really, really want. They've seen, and I don't hide this from them, that it has not been easy. It has been a challenge. You know, we have good days and bad days. I'm not immune to the journey of entrepreneurship. I go through the exact same thing, you know, and you just keep fighting for it because it's what you truly believe in. What do you hope that they learn from this as they grow older? I hope they learn resiliency and to be true to who they are and not be afraid to go get it. I love it. You know, as as I have now young adult children, mm-hmm. I, I look at them. Uh, two of my children, my two daughters have started their own companies. Awesome. And I am... I am humbled and in awe of what I what I see them doing. Honestly, I I look at all three of my children and I see things in them that at their age I don't know that. In fact, I know I I couldn't have done and wouldn't have done what I've seen them do, and uh, I'm so proud of them. And I think a lot of it comes from the the work ethic, the the confidence that they I trust are seeing in the things that I'm doing with mm-hmm. my wife as we're, we're doing what we do. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you, you create a legacy with your kids as you do this and uh, they are watching, they do learn from you. So, yeah, they do. And I was going to say, I bet you, you gave them a huge head start. You know, I, I don't want to take anything from what they've accomplished and done, but you're right. Mm-hmm. I hope that I've given them a, an environment where they were comfortable taking risks I hope that I provided for them an environment where they felt like they could try new things, pursue their interests. Um, One of the things that I did with my children when they were teenagers, they would ask, you know, especially my youngest daughter, she was very much into things and she would always want certain things. And my answer wasn't, you can't have. My answer was, oh, you can have it. I'm just not paying for it. If you want it, go go (laughs) work for it and get the money. (laughs) It's like... I, I'm not here to tell you you can't have something. I mean, yeah. if it's if it's maybe immoral or inappropriate, I'll, I'll I'll definitely put my sense in there. But it was like a cell phone, right? You know, you yeah. want a cell phone? Great. You know, save your money and go buy it. I don't care. It's just not my money. And uh, uh, that wasn't always the case. My wife would sometimes spend money that I wasn't willing to spend. But the point is, though, is the lesson wasn't you can't have it. You you aren't uh, going to have it. It's more power to you, figure out a way to make it happen and do it. And yeah. they rise to the occasion. And that's, I think, something that I'm proud that they have because I see it in today as adults. If they want something, they put their mind to it, they do what it takes and they make it possible. And I see that. And it's just, as a parent, very, very gratifying. And I don't want to take from them because th- this is them doing it. Yeah. But I can, I'd like to think I had some influences, I guess, exactly. what I'm trying to I'm say. Exactly. I going to say yeah. influence for yeah. sure. Uh, uh, you've got three dogs. What three dogs do you have? Unfortunately, I lost one recently. <gasps> oh no, I'm sorry. Was yeah. it was it age? Or? Yeah, she was. Okay. She was twelve and a half. She's a lab, okay. Rosie. So so we we uh, lost her just before Christmas. Okay. And then we have uh, Trina, who's a Schnauzer, and Charlie, who's a Sheepoo. Oh wow! All right. Yeah. So are these indoor dogs, outdoor dogs? Oh, indoor dogs, of course. Indoor dogs. They're babies. Okay. Babies. Oh, so they're both puppies then. <laughs> um, well, no, not really. They're, I just treat them like they are. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So really, you don't have two kids. You have five kids. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, tell me about your cottage. Yeah, the cottage is in Notre Dame du Lot in Quebec, up in Canada. Oh, nice. And it's a beautiful place. We love to go there. So I have a cabin that I've inherited with my siblings from my father. And, uh, that's my refuge. That's my sanctuary. And oh, nice. Where when is I it? Read it, it is um, in Utah, and it's up in the mountains north of a city called Price, in between Price and Duchesne. And uh, I actually was with my father when he found the property and was with him when he built the... It's really not a cabin. It's a shack in the woods. I, I have to be very, very clear. It's uh, it, it's definitely not a second home, but uh, 
for for me though, it is a place where I can go and escape. Up until literally this last weekend, uh, I could go up there and not have any phone reception. So they must have put in a phone a phone tower, a cell tower nearby that now works. But I used to be able to go up there and not have any access to anything civilized. Let's say uh, no running water, no electricity, and uh, it's just a place of of relaxation for me. But uh, I'm going there this weekend snowshoeing, so I'm looking forward oh, nice. to that as well. I love yeah, that. Yeah, so good things. So this has been a wonderful discussion, Melissa. I really I appreciate have loved talking everything. with you today. This is good. I hope the listeners have really mm-hmm. taken from this some gems because I know mm-hmm. I have. Um, I'm going to um, kind of wrap this up and then ask you for a final thought. Is that all right? Absolutely. All right. So here we go. First of all, before I go into my uh, summary, I do want to point out that there is in the episode description a few offers that I would encourage you taking advantage of. As listeners, you can go to the episode description and find there the opportunity to get a copy of two eBooks. One is called In the Black. It's nine principles to make your business profitable. It specifically shows you short-term, mid-term, and long-term things you need to be working on your company to ensure your profitability. The other is the book Profit First. It's the book that was mentioned earlier in our discussion that you can also have a free copy of. With that, you'll actually learn how it is that you can implement strategies in your business and those of your clients to ensure that profit is in fact not only just deliberate and intentional, but first in the business model. And as you implement these strategies, not only in your business, but you can take them to your clients and actually in fact become for them the profit and growth expert that they need you to be. So definitely go to the episode description and take advantage of these free offers to get a copy of each of those eBooks. And also there, subscribe for the podcast so that you can get the notifications as to our weekly episodes and reminders so that you can take advantage of this opportunity to hear from the experts like you have today with Melissa and myself. Now, with that being said, I want to summarize a few of the little highlights that I took from our conversation. Obviously, when we were talking about Melissa's journey to become an accountant, I agree. There's a lot of people out there, yourselves perhaps included, where you're you're just not one who saw this as the career you're going to take. And I really applaud everyone that as they get in this path of becoming an accountant, becoming a CPA, working with business owners, you realize, like we said at the beginning, there's a lot of social work that goes on as we work with our clients. You become a trusted advisor, a confidant, and they'll share with you more things than just the financials. And I think that's something that's very telling of the relationships that we have with a lot of our clients. You get to see an evolution. And as they go through that evolution, it's like Melissa was pointing out, it's, a, it's an evolution towards profitability. We're there to ins- ensure and help them actually find that path and confidence that they need in order to be wealthy and profitable with the work that they're doing so that they can, in fact, have that lifestyle, that dream that they were trying to accomplish all along. Now, the other thing I want to point out is for accounting professionals, many of us do offer traditional accounting services, but there's so much more if you can actually find yourself now moving into a CFO-related role, becoming an advisor, stepping into that capacity of actually now helping the, the business owner, the CEO, now utilize the financial reports and information to make more informed business decisions. I cannot emphasize enough the opportunity that exists for you to complement your accounting, bookkeeping, and tax services with CFO and advisor-related services. They pay very well. They're good for you to offer. And in doing so, you can build astounding relationships with the clients that you have such that you can actually get friends that you wouldn't expect. So I encourage you to do this. And as such, see what you can do to actually go on the same path that Melissa has done to really become that of a fractional CFO. Now, with that being said, Melissa, what closing thoughts do you have for us today? I think from the conversation that we've had today, the first thing that comes to mind is just be true to yourself. I know it sounds very ironic because we talk about money, but it's so important. You know, I think I think we have to be comfortable on our own skin. Mm-hmm. And when you say be true to yourself, that's one of the things that I'm realizing is embracing who we are and leveraging that because you can't be everything to everyone, but you can be true to yourself and be that that one grounded person that others yeah. will identify with. And you'll you'll find the people that you should be working with. So I Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. And you'll step into being who you want to be as a business owner. Very good. Well, Melissa, thank you for your time today. I do, again, want to encourage everyone to subscribe to the podcast. For more information on how you can apply these principles in your business, go to universalaccountingschool.com 
or give us a phone call. You can reach us at 801-265-3777. And always remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care and have a great day. Be safe out there, everyone.